Okay, so in this video, we're going to be going over what's known as the interwar period, which is the period between uh, 1919, when World War I officially ends, uh, and say about 1937 to 1939-ish, uh, when World War II starts. Okay, so uh, a big thing that happens towards the end of the 1920s and into the 1930s is the Great Depression. So we know it here uh, in America as the Great Depression, and uh, we kind of think of it as an American thing here, but this was actually a worldwide depression, and it was actually probably worst in Germany. So if we remember after World War I, Germany had to pay reparations, uh, which meant they had to pay money uh, back to the Allied powers that uh, they lost the war to. So this was one of the uh, demands of the Treaty of Versailles, um, and it was typically seen as a very harsh penalty. Uh, so the country as a whole was struggling to pay back these reparations. It was hurting uh, the everyday people as far as uh, perhaps increasing taxes and the burden on them to pay back these reparations. Uh, many people didn't like it, uh, of course. Um, and then this depression hits and things get even worse. So people have fewer jobs. Uh, the price of basic goods was extremely high. Uh, we'll go over this more in the next video, specifically in regards to Germany and how this depression uh, is one of the factors that leads to the rise of Hitler. Um, but overall, really across uh, the United States and globally, uh, you had an uneven distribution of wealth. Uh, you had what's known as overproduction of goods, so kind of the supply and demand curve was kind of messed up. Uh, and in America, particularly, people were buying less. Um, so you also have uh, inflation, uh, which means that the price, uh, the value of money uh, was going down while the price goes up. So look at Germany here in 1918, uh, not a whole lot of inflation, um, you know, but one gold mark by the time 1923 hits is equal to, you know, one uh, billion paper marks. Is that one billion or one trillion? That might be one trillion. I never was good at math. Um, so you see this inflation going up uh, in Germany in particular, and the value of money is going down. Uh, so in Germany, you would see kids uh, playing, uh, you know, with like bricks of money. People were burning uh, money in the fireplace because it was actually more useful um, as, you know, warmth, fire, uh, than it was to pay for anything. So people would go to the store uh, and they would, you know, pick up a piece of bread for uh, the cost of whatever it was, and then they would bring it to the cashier. And by the time they brought it to the cashier, the the bread was costing even more because the inflation was just so rapid. Uh, so that's something we'll go over more in the next video. But other causes of this depression, uh, you had high tariffs in a lot of different places. Um, so when tariffs go up, remember a tariff is a uh, tax on import, uh, imported goods. Uh, so, so it's a tax on import. So uh, we kind of had these tariff wars where all sides were... Um, increasing their tariffs, and this increases the tax on trade, basically, uh, which discourages trade in many cases. Uh, credit was increasing. Uh, people were borrowing too much money uh, that they basically were using to buy stocks, and uh, eventually the market crashed. Uh, it's known as the stock market crash of 1929, uh, so investors were afraid that uh, the prices were too high. They started to sell. Uh, there was this big panic. It was known as Black Tuesday. Uh, the stock market collapsed. Uh, so here it is. Uh, here, um, you know, this kind of drop in the stock market represents Black Tuesday uh, in October of 1929, and this kind of kicks off uh, the Great Depression. Uh, so a stock is just kind of a, uh, it's a representation of like ownership in a company. So you can kind of buy stock, uh, buy ownership in the company, and when the company does good, uh, you know, you, the price of the stock increases and that ultimately increases your wealth. Um, and, it, and stocks are also kind of a function of how good a company is doing. Um, so when the stock market crashes, obviously businesses crash. 
Um, people's personal investments are wiped out completely, um, their savings. Um, so this leads to high unemployment. People have to, uh, you know, companies have to cut people, lay people off. Um, so factory production declines, businesses and banks fail, farmers lose a lot of, uh, you know, their capacity to make a living because they're unable to pay loans. They're overproducing goods in a lot of cases, uh, and no one's buying uh, from them. Uh, the credit system collapses, banks and businesses unable to borrow or spend. Uh, world trade um, gets hit very hard. Uh, so these tariffs are increasing, but uh, people aren't trading as much. Um, and Germany is hit particularly hard by this. Okay, So they still have the burden of the Treaty of Versailles, where they have to pay back all these reparations. And then you have this inflation, this hyperinflation, um, and it's hitting Germany really hard. The people of Germany are really... Uh, getting hit hard. Um, so uh, what you start seeing, some people think it's a result of um, this uh, this depression, but there's also other factors, is the rise of dictators. So a dictator is a ruler with unrestricted power without any uh, democratic restrictions. Um, and typically this led to totalitarian states, okay, where the governments used uh, intimidation, violence, propaganda, uh, to rule all aspects of life. Uh, so typically you'd see these dictators being very uh, enthusiastic. Uh, they were um, sort of, you know, you can see them kind of, this is Mussolini, but we saw Hitler earlier. They're, you know, they're yelling, they're screaming, they're gesticulating, they're, uh, you know, throwing their arms around, they're pounding their fists, um, and they're trying to rile up emotion uh, in the people. And in many ways, uh, they were successful. So, um you see this in a lot of different places in Europe, the rise of dictators. Uh, so in the Soviet Union, uh, as we talked about before, uh, Joseph Stalin comes to power in the Communist Party, and he kind of gets so the Soviet Union on the path to uh, what's known as strong communism. Um, and um, he puts in what's known as five-year plans and state industrialization. Uh, so he wanted to catch up uh, to basically, you know, Britain um, and the United States and some of these other Western powers uh, as far as industrial uh, capacity. Okay, so industrial, uh, we'll just call it industrial stuff, producing goods, uh, having technology, um, you know, military stuff. Uh, so the way to catch up was to set quotas. Okay, so he would say, like, we need... 1,000 uh, steel uh, furnaces in each village, you have to produce 1,000 tons of steel okay, by the end of the year. So he would put these quotas on every village in the Soviet Union, and the problem was they weren't realistic. Okay, So people would lie about how much they produced, and then when Stalin went to plan everything, he relied on the numbers, which were all made up, uh, because if you didn't hit the quota, uh, you got purged, you got killed, uh, so, you know, in many cases. Um, so that would hurt everyone else because when he's going to redistribute the steel and the food and all that, he's relying on numbers that are all uh, made up. So this leads to famine, uh, this leads to people starving to death, uh, this leads to just all sorts of devastation. Okay, it's one of the reasons uh, communism, you know, typically doesn't work, uh, at least not from uh, what we've seen in the Soviet Union or China or really... Uh, anywhere else, um, and you add on to this Stalin's paranoid nature, okay, he had secret police, he was monitoring people's communications, he was purging anyone that didn't uh, believe in what he was doing, uh, so um, this is uh, disastrous for many people in the Soviet Union. We'll go over more of this, kind of the details, the logistics of it in class, um, but yeah, here you see Hitler in Germany, he's going to come to power in Germany. Uh, so Hitler is capitalizing on a lot of anti-government sen sentiment, anti-establishment. Uh, the economy is terrible. Uh, so he's promising to kind of fix this economic system and kind of bring Germany back to, uh, you know, kind of restore its status as a great power. Uh, so he's emphasizing nationalism and anti-Semitism. Okay, so he scapegoats uh, the Jewish people. Uh, and as well as uh, socialists and communists um, 
to be the people that are the problem with society. So these are the people he targets uh, as not being true Germans, um, and he wants to get rid of all these people, uh, and they become the scapegoat. So another concept you're going to see is Liebenstrom, uh, the German living space. So Hitler wanted what he called living space, space for his German people to expand and live. Uh, so he's going to reoccupy and take some of these territories. Okay, so he annexes Austria, uh, he takes uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, okay, these other countries, uh, these other areas, territories, and people in Europe, okay, in like Britain, uh, France, are freaking out, uh, you know, Poland's freaking out, uh, you know, probably the Soviet Union too, um, and they're wondering what's going on with this guy. Okay, so that's a story for uh, the next video we'll get into, but in Italy, uh, we have Benito Mussolini, uh, so he creates what's known as a fascist government. Okay, so fascism, uh, a good definition is extreme nationalism and extreme militarism. Okay, so it's a combination of, uh, you know, our kind of people, our race, our, uh, our country is superior, and we are willing to uh, basically go out and prove that using military tactics and uh, military domination. Okay, so typically that's uh, what you'll see with fascism. Um, he wanted to restore the glory of the old Roman Empire. He's invading countries just like Hitler is. Okay, Ethiopia gets invaded by Italy, uh, and there's really nothing that these other European countries can do uh, because they don't want to fight back uh, because they don't want to cause another war. And we'll get into this later, but um, it's called appeasement, where uh, they just appeased the dictators. Okay, which means they kind of let them do uh, what they wanted to do. And they did it because they didn't want to fight another horrible war like they did in World War I. Uh, so that's Mussolini. Um, in Japan, you have two guys. Okay, Hirohito is the emperor. Uh, and Hideki Tojo. Uh, so Hirohito is your emperor. Uh, Hideki Tojo is your kind of military general guy. Um, and these guys are start conducting very aggressive militaristic and imperialist policies in Asia. They start taking over a whole bunch of territories. Uh, so they uh, are bringing in resources, trying to industrialize Japan. Uh, and they invade Korea, Manchuria, uh, China, some other areas. The League of Nations protests, um, but Japan just says, forget you guys, and they totally walk out of the League of Nations. So uh, in the old days, we used to say that uh, Hideki Tojo was the mastermind, and Hirohito, the emperor, uh, was just kind of a figurehead. Uh, but now there's some debate, uh, you know, how much was Hirohito involved, how much was he not involved, um, you know, so on and so forth. We'll get more into that later uh, in class, but uh, here's Japan's kind of eastern empire as they start taking over uh, all sorts of stuff here. So uh, that's kind of the intro as we build into World War II.